Hello, I'm OJ Borge and welcome to La Course on Tet's coverage of the 104th Corsa Rosa. As always, it's a hearty ciao to Peloton's Aerogram subscribers and our presenting sponsor for this and the rest of the episodes. Join the Giro is our friends at Specialised. Hey Paolo, suona quella musica! Oh, it sort of feels like Paolo Conte is back in his natural habitat as we waft out of the spring classics and into the intense yet romantic glare of the first grand tour of the season. It's exciting to be here with weekly podcasts across the three weeks of this most intense of races. We'll be looking at who's going well, who isn't, reflecting the drama, as well as digging a little deeper into stories you wouldn't hear on a more run-of-the-mill cycling podcast. And who will be dipping their knowledgeable toe into that particular lake of Chianti? It's Jeremy Whittle. I'm sitting on the terrace of the Borgo San Marco in Puglia, drinking a Prosecco. No, I'm not. I'm at home in Sussex, England. Hi, OJ. It's, it's Pete Cousins here. I'm sitting in the Pyrenees. I'm drinking coffee, trying to stay awake because it's quite late for me. Hi, it's Amy Jones. I am near to but not in Girona, uh, drinking tea because I can't have that much caffeine at this time. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't even have water with me right now. I'm excited to be here for a Giro with all of you. Is it, I mean, I unpopular take, I quite enjoyed a Giro in October, Jeremy. Everyone seems excited about the fact it's back in May. Yeah, I, I think we were grateful last year to have anything, weren't we? Wasn't that the situation? Wouldn't you agree? So it was great to have a Giro at all. Uh, but it definitely feels like, because this season we've had much more of a rhythm, the normal rhythm of the season, it feels like, you know, it's starting to warm up in Europe. Uh, the blossoms are all out, you know, it just feels like it's time for the Maglia Rosa. I was just going to say the balance is restored. My hay fever and the Giro are coinciding, so. I was just going to say that it's it's nice uh, watching watching the first few stages, just seeing the number of people that are out as well. I mean, it just seems like the, the Giro's really kind of uh, captured the imagination of the Italian people again, and I'm, I've been really pleased to see that. Well, hang on a second. I mean, but the problem is we've been conditioned over the past 12, 18 months to think of big crowds as a bad thing. Are you saying there are crowds at the Giro and that's a good thing? I, th- I think so, yeah. Just just reading some of the stuff that uh, Filippo Ganna has been saying in the in the pink jersey, just saying how people are responding to him, how it seems to, to be more popular. There seems to be more of a... I know, more passion for, for the Giro than there has been among the Italian public for a while. I mean, may, maybe that's because... There hasn't been much sport to see. And I think one of the, the beautiful things about cycling is that it's still, you can still feel the passion that, that's there, even though there often aren't fans there. It's kind of the, the sport hasn't been changed that much by, by COVID, really. I mean, not in the way that, that kind of stadium sports had. And uh, people seem to be responding to that somehow. I think, I think I'd agree with that as well. And I think the other thing, it, sh- it shows how strong that relationship is between cycling and people at the roadside, especially in the traditional nations, you know, that, that, we, okay, we haven't lived through wartime, but we've lived through a pretty extreme period in history. And uh, post, post the Second World War, people came out in their droves to watch the Grand Tours because they symbolised liberation and freedom and kind of, you know, pointless indulgence, really. Now, before we go any further, I think it's good to maybe get a flavour of what this, what did I say, 104th Corsa Rosa is going to be like. Amy, what can we expect over the next three weeks? Hmm. So, yeah, the first week is, um, there's like three sprint stages. Um, There's not really much for the GC riders in terms of climbs um, until stages eight and nine, um, which both have uphill finishes. Um, there was actually 10 days of racing before the first rest day, um, which is quite unusual. First rest day is, uh, Tuesday, whatever the second Tuesday is, I don't know the date. Um, and, um, then stage 10, the day before that is a sprint stage too. Um, and then stage 11 is a really interesting stage, um, heading through the Tuscan vineyards. It's 163 Ks. It's like probably going to be raced um as like a a one-day classic um it's kind of punchy um and might catch some gc riders out on that day um the one of the biggest ones has to be mentioned stage 14 the zonkalan 205 kilometers it's an absolutely brutal climb um so the final week is really where we'll probably see the big ding-dongs between the gc riders um stage 16 um 
is a hilly stage just before a rest day. And then after the second rest day is when it gets really hard. Um, so stage 18 is the longest one, which I think is really cruel, like a few days before the finish at 228 Ks. Um, and then stage 20 crosses into Switzerland. Um, stages 19 and 20 are probably going to be quite decisive if there's a, a kind of, if there's not much between a few riders on GC, we could see them um, battling it out on the big climbs. And then a final ITT in Milan that's actually quite long. Um, it's 29.4 Ks uh, on the final day. It's going to be a monster of a Grand Tour. Pete, I always feel like I ask you the same question. Is it a classic looking Grand Tour? Is it a classic looking Giro to you when you look at the parkour? I think so, yeah. I mean, you'd expect kind of... Uh... I mean, the, the the great thing about Italy is you can you can have big climbs pretty much anywhere you go, and uh, they almost have to hold themselves back. I think from 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 sticking them. I mean, Christian Prudon, the Tour de France organizer, must look at the the, the geography of Italy and think, God, I, I wish I wish France was a bit more like that. I wish I had another ridge of mountains going down the west side that I could use. But I mean, the, the Giro they've, they've got so much so much choice of climbs. The, the the problem they've got is is trying not to kind of finish everybody off with the race being too early on in the race and I think the the balance is right I mean it kind of builds up I mean Amy mentioned the stage uh in the in Tuscany through uh at Maltalcino through the across the white roads the the Strada Bianchi and then there's a, the Zonkalan stage which I think they're going up the the, the side of the Zonkalan they've only used once before but it's supposedly the easiest side, but when I looked at the grade, it did it did look very easy to me. <laughs> That's like saying I'm going to use I'm going to use a claw hammer on your knee or your elbow, but apparently it hurts less on your elbow. Yeah, and then and then the 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 final week is just it's just going to be mayhem. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. I mean, there's massive there's massive stages in in the Dolomites. There's there's big stages in the Alps. And that's just what you'd expect. And like like Amy said, a, a long a long time trial on the last day as well, which which could be could prove decisive. It, it could do. And we had so much drama in the last, which was whatever it was, six and a half months ago, in the last Giro d'Italia, which came down to that final time trial, Jeremy. I mean, you wouldn't say, looking at the parkour, that that's going to happen again. You think possibly there'll be stages before it which will have sorted out the order of things. I think this is going to throw up loads of surprises, this Giro, because the other thing I think that may happen is we have the two favourites, Egan Bernal and Simon Yates, have a lot of reasons to kind of... Um, hold fire or hold hold their fire until the final week. But now because of his back, because I, don't, I think he'll want to, I mean, you know, there's no way you can you can soft pedal through the first two weeks of a race like this, obviously. But I think he'll want to keep something in reserve for the final week where those monstrous mountain stages are, the final monstrous mountain stages. And Yates, who will, have, has, will remember the bitter experience of 2018 where he rode fantastically for the first two and a half weeks and then collapsed in the final three or four days when the race looked won. So, and he's referred to that a bit more about, about kind of, you know, uh, keeping his powder dry, so to speak, until until the final week of the race. So I think there might be some opportunists who sneak in there um, on some of those earlier mountain stages, you know, which which even even the Strada Bianca stage, I mean, it, that definitely offers offers opportunities. And some, sometimes I think in recent Grand Tours, we've seen that the really big set-piece mountain stages can be the ones that, don't quite live up to expectation. Then it's some left field stage that we didn't really think on paper was going to do that much. But the wind blows or it's wet or whatever and we get something really, really dramatic. Do you know, if I ever have a tattoo, I think I'm going to get the phrase, then the wind blows or it's wet or something tattooed on me because that... Is my kind of phrase. Well, listen, we're going to talk about who we think is going to win the GC on this edition of the Giro a little bit later on towards the end of the podcast. But now it is time for the latest news from our capo de capi, William Fotheringham, who I like to imagine is yes in the club chair of news, but this time is also stroking a white belligerent looking cat in his torre in Tuscany. Bit of a bike race going on in Italy and I'm beating myself up that I went to the deli last week and couldn't find the Alba to go with the Piemonte weekend. Going to rectify that next week with some Montalcino while reading my first edition of Dante's Paradiso. Anyway, it's been the usual interesting bike racing week. At the Giro, Filippo Ganna was the entirely predictable prologue winner in Turin on Saturday, matching Francesco Moser by winning the last stage in one Giro and the first in the next, and he'll probably win the last stage in this year's two. Sunday into Navarra was Tim Merlier's day, 
proving yet again that Albacine Phoenix are at far more than some guy called Vanderpool Jr. Meanwhile, Annemiek van Vluten won La Vuelta Valenciana, with the final stage going to Erska Ziegart, yet another Slovenian heading for the top. And there was a stage win for Canyon's Alice Barnes, worthy of note because it was the first time a British woman has crossed the line first at this level this year. Elsewhere, Dylan Grunewagen is back after that nine-month ban, and at least the Giro finish in Novara was a right-hand curve, so we couldn't get all exercised about whether he was sprinting in a straight line. And the transfer market has begun hotting up, even before the Giro is truly underway. Sam Bennett to leave Dukunic Quickstep, and we've seen how well that works for other sprinters. And perhaps Heil Maeder to move on as well, which is surprising, until you look at DQS's budget. That old rumour mill is churning early this year, with Sagan and Ackerman also maybe up to maybe set to up sticks. Oh yes, EF Education unveiled some new kit for the Giro. And that's firmly in dog bites man territory as far as I'm concerned. And sadly, there wasn't a duck or anything palace related in sight. Now, off to buy some Barolo. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, William Fotheringham with was that the music to The Godfather? Yeah, it was. No, um, yes, it was, wasn't it? Was it? Uh, wow. Okay. Uh, lots of things to talk about there. I, I think we'll leave the news as it is of the wider cycling world because we're here for the Giro. Um, let's talk about that first stage then, the first opening stage, the time trial. May I say that I am a Felipe Ganna absolute super fan. I want to be him, Amy. His performance was wow. Superhuman is the wrong thing to say in a cycling context, but it was impressive. Uh, yeah, it was really impressive. I think um, he averaged closest or was it 60 k's per hour for the final few k's there um and yeah it was a predictable win but it doesn't take away from the fact that he's obviously a head and shoulders above the rest i mean we're calling him i think the greatest time trialist around at the moment the thing was though pete he didn't go particularly well at the tour romandy did he he, he didn't no i mean he kind of uh, i saw him earlier in the season at the etoile de Bessage where he, he won the time trial there and i think if I remember rightly, that was like his seventh or his eighth time trial victory in succession. He just seemed unbeatable at that point. And then then he lost uh, two or three time trials in a row, including that one at Romandy. And so he kind of, although everybody's saying, yeah, he was kind of nailed on that he was going to win, there was some some doubt there. I kind of, I did fancy uh, Remy Cavagna maybe would, would, would creep through, but he didn't have a great ride today, to be honest, Remy. And uh, I mean, Ganner obviously did. The thing is, every time I look at a picture of him, I think of Seth Rogen. Is that wrong? <laughs> Seth Rogen? I, I haven't seen that. I... Yeah. He looks like if Seth Rogen lost a load of weight, a shed load of weight. Okay. Seth Rogen does listen to this podcast. A nice one. For, he does. Uh, saying he? this is a little over. Little yeah. chubs. I, th- I, think he, I think when I realised how special he was, was, people were just talking about the Etoile de Bessege, and he won that stage that went with that hilltop finish, didn't he, Pete? really impressively held off the bunch so there's much more to him the thing is he's there is much more to him than just the time trialing and I think um I mean I don't think he's going to hold the jersey for that much longer you would imagine to the kind of the middle of next week but he's he's definitely much more than just a time trialist wouldn't, wouldn't you think well, well this well this was the question I was going to ask you because you look at him and you look at the breakaway stage he wins. was it four stages he got in last year's Giro Yep. Was it four stages one in the end, wasn't it? It was the time trials and also that one stage as you just mentioned. Um, could he be in the mould of a Wiggins or maybe some of the other time trialists who became Grand Tour winners? Could he be a GC contender in the future? I mean, the stage he won in the Giro last year was quite mountainous. I can't remember exactly the altitude of the climbs, but I know there was one climb that I think was about 1,500 metres. The weather was pretty bad. He was in the break. And one one from the break, and but he, you know, he weighs eighty k, eighty kilograms. I mean, it's it's unusual for a rider of that that physiology to be that successful in mountain stages. But having said that, he's just got so much power. I mean, we saw it on Saturday in the opening time trial of the Giro, and we've seen it lots of times in the past. That the guy has just got so much speed, and the way he was taking the circuit as well. I'm sure pe- people who saw it were. were you know, their hearts hearts were in the mouths the oh, number of times he well. clipped the curb. 
Well, have you have you ever ridden a time trial bike? Because I've ridden one once, admittedly slightly hung over on a demo day, but <laughs> I was convinced I was just going to have a moment and ride it into a ditch. But the way he was cornering on that, I can't corner on a normal road bike like that. I like I like the way that he uh, he kind of waved at some of his fans as he as... no he didn't he didn't he didn't wave. Apparently, the story is that he had no time splits. His radio had gone, so he was actually saying, "I can't hear you" to the team ah, car. Apparently, okay. unless you know different. No, no. I... Oh, I thought I thought I thought it was like saying. Hey, you at the back, I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, doing the old wrestling thing where you put one hand to your ear. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Let's hear you cheering. It no, it was it was super uh, impressive. And I must admit, I've never seen him looking like Seth Rogen, but mainly because I'm usually just looking at his bulging biceps. <laughs> um, he also, on the second stage, he was, for a moment, he was leading the entire pack. He was The entire peloton was sat on his wheel, considering he was wearing pink. He took some sprint bonuses, didn't he, to stop anyone taking them from... Egan Bernal, apparently. He did, yeah. He t- I think he... I, I don't know how many seconds he, he bagged in the end, but that, that, was, that was his goal. And then, I mean, coming into the finish on that, on that second stage, he was, he was up near the front, often seemed to be on, on his own or, or without Ineos riders uh, nearby. So, but just kind of up there with the sprinters teams, looking after himself, looked supremely confident. I mean, he... He just reminds me of of Miguel Induran when you see see him in time trial mode, and obviously you kind of think of the way that Induran developed in the way that he did over a long period of time. I and mean, is still very young. I don't think Induran won his first Grand Tour until he was twenty seven. So ghana has got like four or five years until he gets to that point. And I mean, if he loses a bit of weight and the Giro decides to put in fifty kilometer time trials, he could win it. He would have to, I guess you would have to have a parkour that is specifically suited to him for him to win it. But then I guess if they wanted a home rider to win it, would, is that something they'd do? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, he's, he's 80 kilograms at the moment, though. I mean, it's a, it's a big ask, isn't it? And, and I mean, isn't he more suited to kind of shorter stage races that aren't that mountainous, you'd think, wouldn't you? With a, with a big time trial in them. I wouldn't want to drag 80 kilos up the Zonkalan. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, no. <laughs> well, as somebody weighs in over 100 kilograms who sat maybe behind this particular microphone, I also wouldn't want to do that. The idea of an 80 is a dream that I can't get to. Now, do the bumpy, dusty roads of the Giro d'Italia give you a hankering for some off-road action of your own? I know it does me. Uh, well, we all know that smoother is faster, so the Future Shock equipped Roubaix Com is the choice going into the rough stuff. Is in stock now. Learn more at Specialized.com or any of your local Specialized retailers. Um, let's talk about sprinters then, who have more than their usual meagre fare, I believe, in an Italian Grand Tour. Pete, you've written about the battle royale between the sprinters we can expect in this Giro. You can find it on lacoursesontech.com. But the, but Merlier is an unexpected arrival on the scene, especially at the ripe old age. And I do say this because 28 usually wasn't old for a cyclist, but it seems to be now with the young band of, and I hate to use the word tyros because that's definitely a journalist word, um, who seem to win everything. How do you think this coming week's two or three sprint stages will shake down? It, it's going to be interesting. I mean, we saw uh, Tim Millier win, win the first one, and uh, I guess it was surprising in a way, although he was, uh, I think he was, he's the rider that's among the sprinters that's won the most races this season. He'd won three before the, coming into the Giro, and he added, added a fourth. Um, I mean, the, the surprise, I suppose, more than anything, is the fact that he's quite unknown. His his team, Alpes in Phoenix, are making their Grand Tour debut. It was their first road stage in a, in a Grand Tour ever. So, so to win it is quite phenomenal. And it's going to be interesting to see um, to see how the, the kind of the, the bigger guns or the the ones that you'd more expect to come come to the fore will, will fare over the next few days. I mean, Caleb Ewan was was completely lost coming into the finish. Uh, Giacomo Nizzolo was, uh, I think I saw a stat saying that it was the 15th time that he'd finished either second or third on a Giro stage, and he's never won one. I mean, f- I mean, it'd be great to see the poor guy end, end that run. And then we've got like Elio Viviani went close again, but I mean, he still hasn't won a big race for, for Cofidis, not in a Grand Tour. And Dylan Gronewegen was, was fourth and uh, didn't really get involved in the sprint at the end. Amy, I... I, I Amy, Pete mentioned Dylan Gronovigan then. I mean, I want to say it's great to see him. I know I'm going to say it. It's great to see him back racing again, but it seems like there's a lot of tenseness around him and the fact that he's back doing what he should be doing, which is racing bikes. Yeah, I also think it's great to see him back. 
I think the ban that he served was, I think it was disproportionate. I think he has been punished for the outcome rather than the action. It's the kind of move that sprinters make. I mean, we saw Sagan on Sunday stage, like barging and headbutting. Like it's just part of the the job of a sprinter. And, you know, I don't think that Jakobsen's comments online the other day were especially helpful in light of the fact that Grunewagen suffered some pretty awful abuse online. Um, and I think I think he's served his time, like he's, he's served his punishment and some. It's good to see him be able to come back and just do his job and get on with it. And I hope that, like, we can just see the end of it all, really. For those who missed it, what did Jacobson say online? Because I missed this. He said that um, they, they, had a, they had a meeting, in, I think bef- before, just before the tour of Turkey in, uh, in April. And uh, it was the first head-to-head meeting that Jakobsen and Gronewagen had had since the incident in Poland last, uh, last year when Jakobsen well, s- sustained horrific injuries, 130 stitches in his face and all, all kinds of other injuries as well. I mean, Gronewagen as well uh, had a broken collarbone. Um, we don't really know what they talked about. I mean, the idea was that nobody was supposed to say anything. And then Gronewagen came out and, and did a 10-page interview in, in Le Keep magazine on... Uh, the Saturday that the Giro started. And I guess that Jakobsen got, got wind of this. Maybe Lekeep approached him and said, look, this is the interview. Have you got any comment to make about it? And uh, he, he, he went on Twitter and basically said, look, we've agreed between, Dylan and I have agreed between the two of us. We're not going to say anything. There's kind of a legal process going on here. Oh, and by the way, he hasn't apologised to me and he doesn't see that he's responsible for this incident. And kind of... Dropped, dropped the whole weight back on 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 Gronewagen again, so the whole thing's kind of picked up momentum again. And uh, I mean, it's 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 not great, really. I mean, if- no, it sounds unfortunate. It's, it's it also sounds like it's you can't say we can't talk about anything due to the legal proceedings, and then immediately say something which inflames the situation. Personally, um, do you think Gronewagen over the course of this of this grand tour, Jeremy? Do you think he can do his job properly? Or do you think the weight of knowing everyone's watching everything that he does and sprinters have to make split-second decisions, do you think that will hamper him? Well, a couple of things on what um, Amy and Pete have said, first of all, that I'd comment on, which is that I think we have to have some kind of established measure for punishment for this kind of incident. So Nasta Bahani did basically the same thing to Jake Stewart a month ago or so. Um, in a race in France, the GP Cholet Pédoloir, I think it was. And it, with without the barriers being good, strong barriers, that would have had the, pretty much the same impact as the Grunewald and Barge did on Jakobsen. And yet there's been no punishment for him and it's been a controversial issue, etc., etc. So I don't think that Grunewald's punishment was disproportionate because I think given the impact of what he did on Jakobsen, I mean, he... he could have been fatal that's the reality it could have been fatal it could have been certainly been a career ending a career ending crash so i don't think it was disproportionate really but i think that what we need to see is the uci establish some kind of way of dealing with these, these racing incidents because as you say they've happened many times before i mean now it's a bit like var in football i think we're getting into that situation where you know this incident has happened there's going to be there's no real precedent for it there's going to be a legal battle running on now. Now they're both worried about what they've said in public or in private, which is really sad as well, because I'm sure from everything I've read about what Gruner Wigan has been through, his contrition is genuine and he was really haunted and appalled by the injuries that Jakobsen sustained. I don't, I don't doubt that he's sorry for what happened. But at the same time, you know, it was incredibly stupid and... It's something we see in races a lot, but we have yeah. we have to have, have if he has a nine month ban, then surely Burhani has to have a nine month ban it, as well. True, true, true. But I think we can go over and over that. Do you think Gronovegan for the rest of this Giro will be looking over his shoulders the wrong way of putting it? Do you think he'll be able to sprint where he would be able to normally without all of this big hoo ha going on in the background? Oh, well it, it kind of depends what happens, doesn't it? Because if there's a sprint crash, if there's a stack up Well, if there's a stack up and he's He's if there's a stack up at the front of a sprint and he's in there sprinting and, you know, there's switching around, which there always is, and there's shoulder to shoulder, which there always is. I don't know. I mean, it is, 
he's a really terrific sprinter. I mean, you've seen that because he's one of the Champs Elysees. You've seen that from the the stages he's won in all the Grand Tours. Um, but I'd 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 be very anxious if I was him um, to say that. Oh, it's great to be back, and I've forgotten it all. I don't see how he can say that. One one thing I one thing I would say about uh, Grunewagen is we 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 saw in the the sprint on stage two the kind of uh, the, the kind of the the, the conclusion of. of of that incident that that happened in Poland, or the ramifications of that, in, and how the the UCI has reacted to it, and how race organisers have reacted to it in the right way. And as much as there was an incident coming into the finish where uh, Fernando Gaviria um, clipped his lead out man, or tried to go down the barriers inside his lead out, lead out man, Milano, and uh, kind of went along the barriers for quite a long way, and actually managed to stay upright. The barriers stayed upright. He stayed upright. He survived, and and of course that that was a great thing to see. I mean, it's kind of ironic that Gronovagen was involved in that sprint, having uh, kind of he he kind of triggered that 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 kind of safety aspect. Uh, who's going to win the sprinter's jersey? Go on before we move on. I'm going to say Giacomo Nizzolo. I think. Uh, Are you? Ooh, okay. Yeah. Why? Because I think that uh, I think Ewan might pull out before before the end of the race, and maybe a couple of the other sprinters might as well because. There's not, yeah. There's not much for them in the last week, and the tour is has been moved a week forward. So if they if they want to race the tour as well, it kind of makes sense to to to, to pull out. Whereas Nitsolo, I'm sure, would will go all the way. I mean, he's finished second in the in the points competition twice before, so uh, hopefully he won't finish second yet again. That would be would be interesting. Now, uh, throughout this year's Giro podcast, we are delighted to be joined by renowned Italian sports writer and Giro press room legend Marco Pastanese, who will be bringing us up to date with the chatter in the convoy with his sketches from Il Giro. 112 years ago, it was Milan. It was uh, 127 riders. It was just five foreigners. It was the start at 2.53 a.m. night time. This year it was a touring, it was 184 riders, and the Giro has finally started. A new movie, a new romance, a new story, and a new history. The first stage was Filippo Ganna's triumph. All the Italians were waiting for his performance, for his time trial, for his victory. The pressure was huge, the stage seemed to be designed just for him, just on him. Filippo, we used to call him a Top Ganna instead of Top Gun, is the best man for Italian cycling movement. Tremendously strong and clean, handsome, spontaneous, smiling. No one better than him. But everybody can imagine that Filippo will lose the pink jersey in the fourth stage, with the first arrive up on a hill in Sestola. The most important stages, as always, will be in the third week. Third week is when you can win the Giro, but in the first and in the second week, especially in the Apennino stages, it's when you can lose the Giro. So watch out! If the Giro d'Italia of last year was a challenge to fight the virus, something like we want to survive, the Giro d'Italia of this year is an effort to get our lives back, something like we want to live, outdoor and outside, participating and sharing, enjoying life and bike. For the third year in a row in Italy, the sales of the bikes overcame the sales of the cars. This Giro d'Italia can be the apotheosis of the bicicletta as a symbol of a new green era fighting the pandemic. So the message is uh, ride your bike, it's cool. Who's going to win? I have no doubt. Simon Yates. 
Marco Pastanese there. So on paper, this Giro looks harder than most. 47,000 metres of climbing, almost 3,500 kilometres of racing, and a first rest day that in fact falls in the middle of the race. There are only three Grand Tour winners in the field. Egan Bernal of Ineos Grenadiers, Simon Yates of Team Bike Exchange, and the veteran, and we can call him a veteran now, uh, of Vincenzo Nibali of Trek Segafredo. All at their best on the toughest climbs. It's definitely, as we mentioned at the start of the show, a climber's race, as he always pretty is, even on the moderate stages that pepper the route. They are made for mountain goats, not rulers. Jeremy, let's take a look then at this first week, the first week of racing. When do you think we're going to see the first big GC battle? I think it could come as early as stage four that we start to see the first chiselling away because that has three climbs in the latter half of the stage, including the Colle Passerino, which is only four, four kilometres, but it has a maximum section at 16%. So that could see just, you know, the first few tentative jabs from some of the riders who hope to do well. Then uh, stage five is a flat stage, but stage six has three climbs and it actually climbs up to 1,500 metres uh, at one point um, and has a not a, really a summit finish, but a hilltop finish with a 15-kilometre climb to San Giacomo above Ascoli. So that, that might be another stage where there are opportunities. So... I don't think this week will be completely about sprinting or about breakaways. I think there will be a little bit of GC action um, on stages four and four and six. So, P, I mean, it looks like an exciting first week, doesn't it? Really? It seems like the perfect grand tour that we'd see. I mean, the, the great thing about the Giro, and we've seen that, that this in the last two editions, is it's impossible to predict what's going on. I mean, nobody would have predict, predicted Richard Carapaz as the winner in in 2019, and certainly not Teo Gagan Hart last year when he was supposedly going to be riding for, for Geraint Thomas, who obviously crashed out in the first few days. So thing, things are going to happen. That's kind of the, the nature of, of Grand Tours and, and particularly the Giro. I mean, I'm kind of flicking down the, the start list and you kind of, we've mentioned some of the obvious names, Simon Yates, uh, Egan Bernal. I mean, Renko of Vanderpool did, did well in the, in the opening time trial. We saw Jao Almeida, his, his De Koenig teammate, not, not doing badly either. But when you kind of flick down the list, there's, there's a lot of other names in there. You kind of think Mikael Lander's been mentioned, but even more unusual names like Emmanuel Bookman, who's finished well up in the well up in the Tour de France, riding for Bora. He could be he could be somebody who who could win this this Giro in the same way that Carapaz or, or Gagan Hart did. So it's going to be fascinating to see how it unfolds in the next few days. Now, it's an absolute fool's errand to try and pick the winner of a Grand Tour, especially when you're doing weekly podcasts, because as soon as a name leaves your lips and is recorded in posterity, who knows what's happened to them over, as you say, a race where anything can happen. So, Amy, would you like to dip your toe in that water and go first? Who are you looking at to win the GC? Who do you think has got it in them this year and why? It's so hard to, to predict, but I think it's hard to look past it's, I feel like I, there's two obvious answers to that in Benal and Yates. Um, but there's big question marks over the two of them for reasons we've previously mentioned. Um, but I think of the two of them, I've got a bit more confidence in Yates for some reason. Um, just I think because he he's kind of got a bit of unfinished business as well with this race um yeah do you think losing to Froome was it what was it three years ago now that he lost to Froome that final stage and he was you know he was all conquering and then Froome did that ride and he ended up I think he ended up an hour down on Froome by the end of the end of the Giro that year do you think he carries any mental scars because of that I don't think so no I would say no I don't think really do you think he does Amy well I I feel maybe maybe mental scars is a bit um strong but I think you would surely, it would be in the back of your mind to think like, oh, I, I've gotten this far before and, and then blew up. But I think not in the way that it would hold him back. I think it's more, a, it would be like a bit more galvanising than anything for him. Oh, so you think he can turn it into a positive? Yeah, I'd like to think so, but maybe I'm being too generous. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, but, but Pete, you think, you think he's absolutely fine about it. Have you spoken to him about it? No, I, was, I think the last time I spoke to him was uh, a couple of years ago at the tour. But one of the, um, one of the, I mean, he came back. Remember that year, and he won the Vuelta at the end of the year. So I mean, he kind of almost used that that bad experience that he'd had to kind of 
triggering himself to, towards success. I think one of the things with Yates is that he's obviously aimed for. I mean, he's, he's, he's come back at the Giro subsequently with a, with the aim of winning it, and and been absolutely nowhere. I mean, that's probably going to be figuring mostly in his mind. I think. I think 2018, he pretty much got everything right. Perhaps he overcommitted early on, and that cost him in the end. But I mean, he. He took three stage wins. He he had the the Maglia Rosa for for an awfully long time, and it, he pretty much got it right that year. But it, it's subsequently that that things have gone wrong for him, and I think that might play on his mind. The fact that things haven't gone quite right for him, and what might go wrong this time. Okay, so then in that case, who's winning it? I, I tell you, I'd really love to see Mikael Lander win a Grand Tour. I, this this could be this could be his year. I just love the way he races. The, the attitude that he has. I mean, he's. I mean, I, I love Spanish cycling, and and I've got a lot of time for the Basque Country and Landers of Basque, and he's he's done huge things in terms of promoting cycling there, bringing the Euskotel team back to back to life, and yeah, I just love to see him do it. Whether he will, I don't know. He always seems to manage to pluck defeat from the jaws of victory. Or so let me make a note here, Amy, because we're going to keep a running tab of this. Amy, you're saying Yates. Oh, no. Yes. It's going down. I'm typing it down. Pete is saying... Mikel Lander. Mikel Lander. Okay. The Professor Yass- Yaffle of the uh, of the peloton. Come on, Jeremy. Um, I think that uh, the Giro will be won by Simon Yates. I think he's laying, laid, laying? laid the ghosts of the past uh, in terms of the Giro because he won the Vuelta. Uh, he's won the Tour of the Alps, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I think he's much older, wiser, and the team is older and wiser as well. And I think that's exactly what they've come here to do. And I think there will be a voice in his head saying, don't waste energy the way you did in 2018. Don't make pointless, you know, exploits when you don't need to. Sit and wait, sit and wait. Which is why, as I said, I think the first two weeks might be, um, you know, a bit of a kind of hedging hedging contest. But then I think... Vlasov, Alexander Vlasov will probably push him pretty close. Looking looking at the time trial results, I always think you can tell a lot from the opening time trial. Vlasov is 11th. He's a coming man. He's a really polished climber now, getting better all the time. Um, he has bad days, but they're getting less. Uh, he's won on Mont Ventoux in the Mont Ventoux race. So he's proven he can, you know, the, the, the worst and the most fearsome of climbs he can cope with as well. And if you look at the time trial performance, then I think it shows that he'll be resilient throughout the whole race as well. He, or he's he's in really good form. And in third place, I think we've got Jao Almeida. Um, I don't think Bernal's back will last up. I mean, you look at Remco, Evan Apul, obviously, Hugh Carthy, Bernal, Nibali, Lander, but I just don't see, just don't see really beyond those three, Yates, Vlasov and Almeida. How come Jeremy gets to say... <laughs> I did actually tell him only one, but he still went for three. <laughs> <laughs> I also had... I had Vlasov written down as well. And he's got the exact same birthday as me, but two years younger. So I like him. So we've got two for Yates and one for Lander. I'm just going to throw a little cat amongst the pigeons. And this is partially a nod because we have a lot of American listeners, but partially because I think he's going to go under the radar. And that is Hugh Carthy for EF Education Nipper. What's the name of the team? I've lost track of the name of the team. EF Education First? EF Duck. EF Duck. Thank you, That's a joke. Jeremy. That's a joke. Uh, for it- EF... EF, EF Nippon Education First Garmin. Yeah, I'm just going okay, for EF. <laughs> Hugh Carthy, for the people who normally race in pink. I'm going to go with him. I think he looked great last year, but I feel he's got a great performance in him, and I think he's going to do just enough to always be there or be or thereabouts. And I've got a a bit of another love for him because, like he, uh, the same age as him, I also couldn't control all of my limbs. It looks like his limbs belong to other people, and I love that about him. No, when I was the same age as him, I also had limbs that didn't look like they belonged to me. Because sometimes you look at Hugh Carthy and you think, are they really your legs? Are they really your arms? And I think he's a lovely racer. And I think I actually believe he's going to be there or thereabouts for the entirety of this Giro. And I just think, I just think he'll do enough. When everyone else is going at each other, he'll just sail on through and win it. So I'm going to put my name down. So your top three? Uh, my top three is going to be Hugh Carthy, Vincenzo Nibali, and Simon Yates in third. Has everyone taken notes? 
Johnny Gidd again. <laughs> I didn't want to do a top three, but I have done. Uh, and that is it. We're pretty much done for this first La Course on Tech podcast here. Uh, so thank you very much to Amy, to Pete and to Jeremy as well. We do have so many other business. Uh, I know you wanted to talk about Amy before we leave. And that is what? Whose helmet? Giacomo Nizzolo's helmet. Um, so in Italy, during the lockdown, they had to have a um, a piece of paper to allow them to go outside where they had to write down the reason why they were going out uh, and sign it. Um, and he wrote that he, I can't remember exactly, but it was along the lines of, um, I have like dispensation to go outside and hunt for stages. And he's got it stuck on his helmet. <laughs> Well, there you go. Thank you very much to Amy, to Pete and to Jeremy as well for being with us for this first La Course on Tet podcast. There'll be more writing at lacourseontet.com. Again, we thank our friends at Specialised. Now, do the bumpy, dusty roads of the Giro d'Italia give you a hankering for some off-road action of your own? I know it does me. Uh, well, we all know that smoother is faster, so the Future Shock equipped Roubaix Com is the choice going into the rough stuff. It's in stock now. Learn more at Specialized.com or any of your local Specialized retailers. Thank you to Amy, to Pete and to Jeremy as well for being here for this first of our La Course on Tech podcast through this Giro d'Italia. We will be back in one week's time. Make sure you subscribe and give us a rating as well. You can find more writing... You can find more writing at lacourseontet.com as we head through this Giro. Thank you again to our presenting sponsor, Specialized, and we'll see you next time. Cue the music. Via, via, vieni via di qui. Niente più ti lega questi luoghi, neanche questi fiori azzurri. Via, via, neanche questo tempo.